Welcome to Under the Lens. Come and enjoy an extraordinary, raw, and unfiltered podcast that delivers debate, discussions, and interviews about film, pop culture, and everything in between. Here is your host, film critic and journalist, Byron Lafayette. The Godfather is one of America's most popular and iconic cinematic masterpieces. It won three Oscars at the 1973 Academy Awards, and the American Film Institute named it the second greatest film of all time, behind only Citizen Kane. Nearly 50 years after its premiere, it remains a cultural landmark, with a fan base spanning generations. However, the story behind its creation was as dramatic and entertaining as the film itself. Vanity Fair writer Mark Seal tells the incredible true story of the making of The Godfather, in Leave the Gun, Take the Cannoli, which features in-depth interviews with the director, producer, cast, and crew. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Mr. Seal and discussing some of these entertaining stories that he included in the book. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. Well, I got uh, the uh, publisher sent me the book here. And uh, you're right there. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really, really nice. I want to congratulate you on on a magnificent work. (laughs) Thank you so much. Well, it was uh, it was amazingly written, and uh, you know I couldn't put it down at certain points. It was just you know just it read like a novel almost. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, so you know you you've written a, a, a great number of books, uh, you know, and, of nonfiction books on different topics. Um, did you have like any idea what you were getting into when you first started that article about like the making of The Godfather, what it was going to turn into? <laughs> No, I did not. Uh, I just thought it was a great story for the magazine. And uh, thankfully, my editors did, too. And I just went on this kind of a roller coaster ride and I didn't know where it was going to end up. Of course, I was hoping that, you know, it would end up in a great place and maybe a book or whatever. But, you know, you never know when you start a a magazine story where it's going to end. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, Okay, And um. You know, in your opinion, you know, when it comes to, you know, The Godfather as a as a franchise or, you know, just even as the first motion picture, um, you know, uh, the filmmaking, the story, the plot, all the different elements. um, What do you think it was that initially endeared that story to the American public? You know, because like what you were saying in the prologue of, you know, that you didn't know anything about the book in the beginning when you first saw it in theaters, but it just grabbed you. (laughs) Yeah. As I say in the book, I was a college freshman on spring break (laughs) and I went into the theater as one person and, and I came out as another. I was stunned. I had never seen anything like like it. And I think the reason, and this is, uh, you know, it began with Francis, uh, with uh, Mario Puzo's novel, and it continued with uh, Francis Ford Coppola's direction of the movie um, and the screenplay that they co-wrote together, uh, that they, it's the story, as Coppola said, of a king and his three sons. Mm -hmm. And even more than that, it's the story of an Italian American family and I think those are the things that endeared it to the, the hearts of the world. It, it's not just a story about gangsters. It's a story about a, a family. Uh, it's a story about a king and his three sons. It's the story of Don Corleone and Michael and Fredo and Sonny and all of their wives and children and everything else. So that's what made it more. And that's what elevated it to the level of myth. Mm-hmm. I agree. Cause that is true. Like, you know, when I think back to when I first saw it and such like, you know, you know, my memories that I recall and you, what a lot of my friends recall, it's not really the shootouts or, you know, the gangster elements. It is the, the family element of it. Exactly. And that's what makes it so compelling. And that's what makes the magic of it. I believe. I agree. And uh, so, you know, I was, uh, I was struck kind of when I was, you know, like reading it, you know, you know, the, the real life people, you know, that you were discussing in the book and such that, you know, they, they were so larger than life, you know, and that they, they almost, they, they felt as big as a lot of the characters, you know, within the novel and within the movie itself. Um you know, and that being the case, you know, with you, with you talking to these kind of some of the mythic people, you know, did you have to like alter your interview approach for different people that you talk to, um, you know, with their personalities and stuff? 
Not really. You know, everybody was so nice and forthcoming. And it was just like, you know, beginning with Bob Evans, uh, who has since passed away. I was able to interview him in his home. Uh, I always back then and now I love to do interviews in person. And uh, I was able to do a lot of that for the story and uh, and some for the book, not as much for the book because of the pandemic. But at the same time, um, you know, everybody seemed to be pretty forthcoming. And a lot of them have passed away, like Charlie Blue Dorn, uh, the, who owned the studio, who was such a larger than life character. You know, I wish he was still around, you know, because he was so instrumental in the film and so larger than life. It's very it's it's very true, especially when it, when it comes to like Hollywood and the mob people. You know, it, yeah. it, it seems that way a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, on uh, on page, I think it was two ninety. I think in my notes here, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you mentioned about how uh, how Coppola, um, you know, how he mentioned the mob and America being very intertwined, and kind of right. the mob being America's story, and you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And you know that that part I found so so fascinating. Um, and I guess um, I was wondering if you could expound a little bit on that idea and like what you, what you thought of that and um, and whether you agreed with him or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did because he was that was in the 19. I think he was talking. He did that interview. Um, I think it was Sight and Sound magazine or something. And he did that interview after the movie was out. But it was he was talking about in the especially in the 70s, you know, there was so much protest and there was so much uh, diversion in the in the in the country. And I think he was taught he was speaking to that. And that's when the movie was filmed. It was filmed in 1971, you know, which was a different time. And there were, you know, Vietnam and, and Nixon and protests and everything else. So this movie was filmed in a very uh, tumultuous time. And even though you don't see that on the screen, it kind of is reflected in the movie in some sense. No, yeah, I, I would I would agree with you with that because it, it is interesting, you know, especially when it comes to filmmaking films, you don't always sometimes take into account when a movie was made or when the right. script was written, you know, but yeah. that of course it influences any any sure. film that's made. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah, it definitely did. And, you know, there was, and then the things that happened behind the scenes were, you know, as, as I write in the book, almost as fiery as the things that happen on the screen with the uh-huh. Corley Jones. <laughs> That's very true. Oh, yeah. Um, in, uh, in, in the same chapter uh, that he mentions about, you know, um, America and the mob, um, you know, I, I found it very interesting about uh, Coppola, how you mentioned how he had like a nine page uh, single spaced outline for the wedding. Um, and I remember the wedding scene in the uh, in the film. And it was very, uh, very magnificent and, and such. Um, and I was I was wondering, like, in your opinion, you know, what do you think it was that drew Coppola so much to that scene that he, you know, he outlined it so much versus maybe coming up with, you know, or attaching himself to something else within the. Picture? Yeah, I think that scene was so important because in that scene, you introduce all of the main characters. Uh, this is what Mario Puzo did in his book. He all and in his magazine articles, he, he wrote Pulp Fiction magazine articles, and it was important to introduce in those articles the main characters in the first scene to grab the reader. <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's what this scene does in the movie, because you meet the Don, you see his constituency, you go outside, you meet his sons, you see them, you see Johnny Fontaine, you see uh, Carlo and his and his and his bride at the wedding. So it it, it fluctuates between the business going on in the house and the frivolity, the Italian American of an Italian American wedding, and it just is so perfect, and it sends the whole movie off into this amazing uh, uh, path from that point forward. So I think he knew that that wedding was all important to get right. Mm-hmm. It's very, very true. And it kind of sets the tone of almost the the royal family or the royalty, right. you know, in the sense of yes. you know, like like you mentioned before, a, a king and his three sons, you know. <laughs> yeah, remember where where the Don says, "Wait, wait, Michael's not here," you uh-huh. know, and they go and get Michael. And then Kay, you know, he, he insists that she come into the family photograph. Mm-hmm. I mean, just as he as he wrote in his production notes and said in the production meeting that's in the book. 
a million things happening at once. You know, he wanted all these things happening, which he pulled off with such greatness. Well, it's true. Yeah. And not, not every filmmaker, you know, is able to do that with it, with it, a film. And, and like I said, just, you know, I was looking through the book. I was like, I was amazed at, you know, just what was going on behind the scenes and everything, you know, cause before I was just like, Oh wow, this is just, you know, this is a masterpiece. This is a great movie. But then that was all I kind of thought of it. <laughs> I didn't think that. Right. Um, yeah. So it, it didn't happen by accident. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was um, there was a, another part. It was in chapter eight, uh, I believe, um, that you mentioned um, this little vignette uh, of uh, Coppola being the first to use uh, reel to reel uh, videotape. Yes. Uh, with the cameras. And and that was something um, I didn't I didn't know. And I thought it was so, so interesting. And I loved how you mentioned about how the actors, you know, didn't know <laughs> when the cameras were rolling during the, during the auditions or not. And, you know, was, was that in your opinion, you know, just kind of like a, a quirk that Coppola did, or do you think that that was on purpose that he wanted to try and catch, I don't know, like the true essence? I of the yeah. I don't know about that. I I don't know. I, I can't say for sure about that one because, you know, I didn't ask about it. I just noted that that's what they did. Mm -hmm. I think they did so many auditions that there was one person coming in after another that maybe they did it, did it just for expediency of time. I don't know for sure on that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, it was definitely interesting reading about the audition process and, and you know, the whole, whole thing of, of Robert De Niro almost being in the first yeah. one, you know, yeah, but he was going to play, play. <laughs> you know, if he had played Pauly Gatto, mm -hmm. which he was uh, up for, then, you know, he would have been dead. Uh -huh. the, movie, the character. So, you know, he wouldn't have been able to or maybe who knows. But, he, you know, he comes back and does that magnificent mm -hmm. performance as the young Don. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was a good, good thing. That <laughs> it ended up being a being a good, a uh, good career uh, <laughs> event that happened. Right. To him. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, the. um you know, uh, there was the uh, the one part that you mentioned with uh, with Al Reddy and how he was like the quote unquote conduit of the mob uh, for the between the mob and the film um, and how they were involved with the with the making of it. Um, you know, for those who who haven't uh, who who will be listening, I should say, <laughs> um, who haven't read the book, um, how involved was the mob in the making of this of this picture? Well, what happened was, is that the Italian-American uh, uh, League um, was protesting in the beginning to stop the movie because they felt, you know, they were protesting against the stereotyping of um, Italian-Americans in popular culture. Mm -hmm. And the, the founder of that league was Joe Colombo, mm -hmm. who was reputedly the head of one of the five families. And they tried to stop the movie. Uh, and and uh, to his credit, Al Ruddy, this incredible producer, <laughs> uh, met with uh, Columbo. And uh, all they wanted was one word uh, not to be used in the script. Mm -hmm. And that was mafia, because they felt that one word summed up everything that they were against. And so Ruddy knew that there was only one place in the movie where that word was used. And he just says, okay, we'll take it out. Mm -hmm. And it was for, uh, you know, for one, you know, take word taken out, they received a world of cooperation. Mm -hmm. And from that point on the doors <laughs> open and uh, you know, the movie was on. <laughs> Man, that's, that's, in, that's incredible. Just <laughs> removing one word. Oh. Exactly. And it was only used one time in, uh -huh. in the existing script. So it wasn't much to take it out. <laughs> no, exactly. Yes. It, it's a good thing. They didn't have it all throughout. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Man, that's, that's fascinating. Um, let's see here. Uh, okay. um, you know, in a, uh, uh, in the the beginning, you know, the prologue of your book, you know, you kind of describe, uh, you know, uh, your first meeting, you know, with a with a mobster and stuff, and um, you know, you talk a little bit about about it in the book and stuff. But uh, but how was that for you, like going into that that interview? Oh, you know, I, every the thing is about me. Whenever I go into interviews, every everybody just is is been very forthcoming, and you know and uh, helpful. And, you know, I was able to interview a lot of people uh, for the article and then for the book. And, you know, every interview is just, you go in and you do your best and you have your questions ready. You're as well prepared as you, as you would like, as you can be. 
And then from there, it just takes on a life of its own. Its own. So everything went smoothly with the whole process. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's awesome. Oh, did you, um, did you, ex- you know, cause going a, a little bit back to the, you know, the first question when I was saying of, of, of you um, knowing or not knowing what you were getting involved sure. in, did sure. you expect to do, you know, like the over a hundred interviews of what you ended up doing or, or were you expecting? Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I was hoping to, I, you know, because you never know you interview somebody and they say, well, have you spoken to so-and-so? And then you speak to that person. They say, well, have you spoken to so-and-so? And so it's a snowball effect and you just <laughs> interview as many people as you can hoping to find out things that maybe, um, you know, uh, uh, people that haven't spoken or maybe, you know, people that have more to say or, you know, you just kind of keep on as interviewing as many people as you can. Uh-huh. No, I think that, that is very true. You know, you, you never know what person is going to have a little tidbit or, or some type of information that maybe nobody else has. <laughs> Exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, which is, you know, the, uh, the, uh, entire reason for this, this interview and this, this book about the Godfather, you know, <laughs> so, right. Uh, you know, um, you know, this, you know, one, one thing, you know, that I really liked about your book too, is that, you know, it has pretty much everything, you know, it has obviously the, the mob, the, the mafia, it has assassinations, conspiracy, Hollywood glamour it has everything. Um, and, you know, there, there was one, uh, one part, it was in the, um, the, the, I want to say the last quarter of the book or so, um, uh, when you were talking about the, you know, the shadowy FBI agent, you know, um, oh, yeah. you, know, you know, been, been in contact and, and that whole story was so fascinating to me about, you know, how he, you know, he was planning on going to the, to the rally, you know, he was like, don't go to that rally, you know, that's uh, right. Yeah. You know? And, uh, and that part was, was so interesting. And, you know, do you think, you know, in, in your opinion, you know, with the, the FBI being in contact with him before and, and at that point, you know, um, you know, were they so interested in it because of the all of the the mob connections that were going on with that with the film? Is that, in your opinion, why they were in contact with him? I would say most likely. I don't know, because, you know, that's been a long time I'm, <laughs> and, and I'm not we don't know who the agent was. So I don't know about that. I, I wish I could answer that question because I would have loved to have spoken to that person, but we don't know who it was. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Cause was, that was definitely interesting. I was, you know, I was like, Oh man, I was like, this, 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 you know, reads like a, you know, like a, it's like a, a spy movie. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to know that. Uh-huh. It's awesome, man. Well, you know, um, you know, I, I really liked, you know, uh, how kind of you began and ended the book with uh, um, kind of in the same place, you know, which was right. you know in, in Robert Evans, you know, bedroom. Um, right. And I loved your description of, of, of his bedroom, his fur covered bed in the beginning, you know, and, and how he's like, hey, we're going to go in here now and talk. It was it was it was great. Thank um, you. Uh, but it was like, you know, I, I, you know, you referred kind of to, you know, his, his bedroom kind of as like his portal to other, other worlds, you know, where he'd, he'd, he'd screen films and such. Yeah. Um, and so like, do you, in your, you know, do you hope that, you know, this book that you've written, do you hope that it is a portal to another time in some ways? <laughs> oh gosh, I hope so. That would be great because what is a movie, you know, except a portal into another world? And that that's what I thought Evans was all about. He loved movies so much, you know, and he watched them uh, in his bedroom because his screening room had burned down. It was no more. So he had to watch. He watched movies there. And, and that was his portal to all these other worlds. And I hope that book, the book does that. That would be the greatest praise ever. You know, just as a movie does, you go in and you're suddenly immersed in another world. And that's the magic of movies, of course. That is that is very true. Yeah, it, it reminds me. I've been, you know, as I've been streaming stuff, I see the uh, the ads for AMC Theater with Nicole Kidman, and talks about that. You know, movies take you places. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know. It's so great. Mm-hmm. I'm so, so glad great. to be back in the theater. Oh, I know. Yeah, that, that's that's been the the number one thing I was looking yeah. forward to with everything being, you know, starting to wind up. I was like, oh, I can go back to a theater again. You know, I was like, I, I love my TV and my snacks at home, but there's something something special about being in there. You know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. The um, you know, uh, it was uh, the title. I um, I want to say uh, that your one uh, article that you did for a vanity. Uh, Fair, the over the hill gang um, that um, that I've read about how how that was turned into a film in 2018 um, with uh, Michael Caine, uh, King of Thieves. 
And uh, um, I've added that to my uh, to my watch list since then. Oh, uh, good, <laughs> good. I hope you like it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, it, it sounded it sounded awesome uh, when, I, when I was looking over what it was about. Um, you know, and so obviously, you know, with kind of you know that article being being made into a film and such. Um, you know, when I was when I was reading this book, you know, I, I was kind of thinking, I was like, man, I was like, this book itself would make a great movie just because of all of the drama behind the scenes. I was like, in my head, I was imagining almost kind of like you know how they did like the disaster artist, you know, um, based off of the room, uh, and, you know, and um, and so you know, would you would you ever be open to to if somebody approached you about making a making this particular book into a, a who knows? Yeah, who knows? That's you know the book's just out, so I'm just glad to get the book out at this point. <laughs> but who knows? Yeah, who knows what, what could happen? Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm just uh, so happy you like you like it and that it uh, that it spoke to you and that that I really appreciate that. Oh, no, d- definitely. I, I, I love, you know, uh, making of and like, you know, kind of behind the scenes Hollywood books and, and biographies. But but I can say, honestly, I think that yours is one of the one of the best that I've that I've uh, read. So and I'm not just saying that because I'm doing the interview. So <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, where can, uh, you know, like people, uh, readers and listeners, like where can they can they get a hold of this book? <laughs> yeah, they can. um you know, uh, either get it on Amazon or uh, Barnes and Noble, or, you know, I think you can, you can go to any of these sites or you can go to my website, uh, www.mark-seal.com. And, uh, or you can go to the Simon Schuster website and, and if you Google it, you'll see it come up and you can order the books there. Perfect. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, anybody like wants to follow, follow your work, um, uh, where can they, can they follow your, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your career? I yeah. Say. If you look on my website, there's links to social media and there's a bio and everything else there. So they can get, get on there for sure. And, and follow whatever. Awesome. And well, I, what I'll definitely do is I'll, um, I'll post all the links to everything, uh, in the article, um, okay. and, uh, and with the podcast and such. So, you know, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with me about, about your book. <laughs> Thank you, Byron. I really appreciate your enthusiasm. Thank you all for listening. As always, it's been a pleasure to spend this time with you all. If you enjoyed this podcast episode and want more of this type of content, please subscribe and share with a friend. Also, if you would consider leaving us a review and star rating, this helps us to grow and continue to deliver quality content. Welcome to Under the Lens. Come and enjoy an extraordinary, raw, and unfiltered podcast that delivers debate, discussions, and interviews about film, pop culture, and everything in between. Here is your host, film critic and journalist, Byron Lafayette.